Hi, I'm Michelle Adabato. The North Ward Center is committed to educating the public about the importance of community programs that give all New Jersey residents a chance for a better life. That's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. The healthcare landscape in New Jersey next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community, the New Jersey State Nurses Association, and the Institute for Nurses, advocating, positioning, educating NJ's RNs. The New Jersey Association of Health Underwriters, New Jersey's benefits specialist. ShopRite Supermarkets. The North Ward Center. Josh S. Weston. And by Century 21 Construction. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by Meadowlands Regional Chamber. Building essential connections that drive business growth. Welcome to Caucus, I'm Steve Adubato. You know, the healthcare landscape in New Jersey continues to evolve with the mission to deliver the best care at the lowest cost. Here to discuss these very significant changes in healthcare. Today we have Marianne Baccalini, who is the president and CEO of Samaritan Healthcare and Hospice. Rich Miller, president and CEO of Virtua. Frank Rosari, Rosari is president and CEO of Rosari Salons, Spa and Schools. And finally, Betsy Ryan, President and CEO of the New Jersey Hospital Association. I want to thank all of you for joining us to talk about the healthcare landscape in New Jersey. Uh, Rich, you've been with us just a few times. Yes. I'm curious, is the landscape changing A and B? Is it moving in the right direction? Loaded question, I know. Yeah, it, great question, Steve. I think it is. I really do. And I think over the last couple of years, it's been moving more toward an outpatient model of care. We're seeing patients outside the hospital walls. And the goal is to keep the patients outside the hospital walls. And what we're really talking about is caring for them at home mm. through care coordination and making sure they're seeing their primary care physician. So at Virtua, it's more of a health and wellness model than it is a sick care model today. Yeah, Rich talked about the role of the primary care physician. Let's jump in here. By the way, the perspectives here are so interesting because you have four, it could be like 50 perspectives but on health care, mm -hmm. but four really interesting ones important ones. The role of the primary care physician today, how important? Critical. Uh, critical, as Rich said, to keep the patient out of the hospital. How? To, to provide care to them before they get sick, to identify disease early, to treat it early, and to keep the patient out of the hospital where possible. For, I'm a, you know, been with us long enough, both of you, for the first time. Um, you'll be back, but here's the question. I always ask for example. So what would this primary care physician do where he or she would actually help keep a patient out of the hospital because he or she would do something that was proactive, assertive, preventive. Help us understand that. It could be as easy as someone who has the, a bad flu, who goes to see their physician, gets the right treatment, and prevents a, a case of bronchitis or pneumonia that could land them in a hospital ER. But also, isn't it rich that, that these primary care physicians have their teams reaching out and saying, hey, you know what? You do for a checkup. We're reaching out for you before you miss it. Yeah, and it's, it's actually larger than that, Steve. It's actually, I consider our primary care physicians now health coaches. Health versus coaches? Health coaches versus what I would call episodic care providers. And what that means is when a patient comes in or a person comes in to see their primary care physician, I'd rather have my primary care physician sitting there mapping out what they see longitudinally in their lifetime. You know, these are the things I see coming in the next 10 to 15 years, and how do we prevent that? The nurse practitioner can provide episodic care in a primary care office if you have a cold or a flu. You know, he or she can provide that level of care. I want my primary care physician to be what I call my health coach for nutrition and for wellness. Mm. We're going to be talking about reducing ER visits and mm -hmm. readmittance, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. But I'm going to shift gears and bring both of you in. Frank, let me ask you something. 200 employees? Yeah. How challenging is the healthcare landscape for you and your organization? By the way, describe your organization right now. We have salons, schools, and spas in the southern New Jersey market. And what's your logo again? Not your logo, your tagline. Uh, we're in the make people feel good business. And you sure are. Um, question, how challenging right now? It's in terms very, of the healthcare piece. It's very challenging. Because? 
Um, one, to understand it with a lot of the different changes in costs. You know, I mean, the most important thing for me as a business owner is to take care of my employees. And in my, in my industry, the salon and beauty industry, healthcare isn't something that's really, you know, it's not there for them. So, you know, it's, it's not offered uh, as part of their pay package. So at Rosiri, we, that was something that was really important for us to make sure that we offered health care. And I wanted to be, you know, help my employees out. And through the course of the last few years, especially over the last two, with all the changes in health care <laughs> and the increase in costs, it's been, it's been difficult. How have you dealt with it? Well, you know, you, just like any other small business, you kind of you suck things up. Sometimes, unfortunately, our employees are picking up um, the, the increased cost. Uh, we've changed our deductibles. Uh, but what we're finding out is with the change of deductibles, now a lot of it is more out of pocket. So not only do they have the cost of their monthly you know, premium and their health care costs, they're actually taking more money out of their pocket. You know, to because we've increased, we've had to change our deductible just to get, just to get the number to where we can afford it. But it's a big part of what you, big aspect of what you think about all the time as a business owner. Uh, yeah, because I'm like, how can I afford it? Am I going to have enough money to to keep on offering mm -hmm. this, you know, portion of my business, which I think is very important. And they're very important to you, and you're thinking about them all the time. Marion, let me let me try this because the whole hospice piece of this, the palliative care yes. hospice piece. What is the connection between hospice care and the healthcare landscape slash reducing healthcare costs? Okay. Well, it's a significant part of the healthcare continuum because um, you know there's a saying that Americans think that dying is optional. <laughs> and, <laughs> you mean it's not? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, but uh, so as illness advances, um, that's where a lot of the costs are. Uh, at, at when uh, but then there's a time where treatment is not as impactful or it's actually harmful. And so at that time when uh, things become complicated for people, they add more diagnosis, they have more medicines, they have more visits, um, there's more burden on them, their quality of life and their functionality is decreasing, um, and the impact of the treatment is, is lessening. That's a time where uh, you really need a palliative care Define palliative care. Palliative care is a specialized medical care uh, given by board certified physicians and nurse practitioners and an interdisciplinary team that um, focuses on improving or optimizing quality of life through symptom management, uh, through setting goals of care with the patient and family, uh, really talking with them about what's important and uh, to them. And, and, you know, how they define quality of care and building a care plan but, around that. But, but, Rich, how does that reduce cost? Well, the, the key to, to uh, hospice care and palliative care, and a lot of it, Steve, is in the education of the patient. So having, you know, Samaritan Hospice is our partner at right. Virtua. They're our partner in hospice and palliative care. So they have, a, they have on two of our campuses, they, they have their, their sites. So we're able to take a patient who, who may need end-of-life care appropriately and move them into hospice care where they're cared for in a special way, in an appropriate way for them, instead of keeping them in the hospital where the care and the cost is not where it needs to be. So we're able to move them into a different location at a lower cost model, but at a higher care model. It's, it's a great combination for any health system to have that ability to move patients into the right level of care. But, but Betsy, as I'm listening to Rich, I'm thinking, okay, so you have it, mm -hmm. you have this relationship. Is it the norm? Is it standard? Is it across the board that every hospital does this? It, it is, and it, as Rich said, it's all about communicating with the patient and the patient choice, what they want. Sometimes more care in the hospital is not better care. Say now, someone, sorry for interrupting, I want more care. I want my mother to have more care. I want my father to have more care because that's what I want. Well, I think it's about what the patient wants and the clinician <clears throat> communicating with the patient and the patient making that decision perhaps with, with the family, with their son. Uh, and if they want more care, I think we'll give it to them. But again, sometimes more care is not better and it does not enhance the quality of life. And it costs a lot. And it does And if we ask ourselves, lot. why does health care cost that much? Why does it drive up premiums? This is part of the answer. End well, of life yeah. care is yeah, definitely I, part of the answer. And I think, as, as Betsy knows, and, I, and Mary Ann certainly knows, that the, the end of life care process is the highest cost of care. 
and then also the chronic disease portion, which is more the front end of care. Mm -hmm. So at the book ends of care, if you consider it that way, are the highest cost issues. And New Jersey, end of life care, highest in the country? Highest, uh, no, uh, it's the highest cost for, uh, for people in the last year of life, but but the worst outcomes. Um, whoa, 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 what? Mm -hmm. Because I don't get it's, that. it's well, because people are seeking treatments that then are no longer really effective, and uh, so that's where palliative care specialists come in in conjunction with the primary care doctor or the other specialists, because people are seeking treatments through their chronic illness when they're in a, and keeping them stable. But then there's a point in time where then comorbidity set in, as I had described before, and, and then it becomes more of a, a futile effort. But people then don't know when uh, they should keep treating wow. um, or when it's time for them to consider other options. It costs the most, but has the least positive effect. That's correct. Let me ask you something. As a business owner who is also very philanthropic and tries to make a difference, when you listen to this conversation, <clears throat> what are you thinking? Um, how's it affecting me? I mean, I, a, me and my that's business. That's where I'm well, asking. now I'm hearing that affects me a lot, mm -hmm. you know, which, again, I always say in life, you know, I like when I can control things so I can kind of control the <laughs> outcome. And like, it's when you become to the point in this situation, and all business owners are all, all businesses, we're all a part of it. I think it's very important to have this care, believe me. I mean, you know, I have parents, so, I mean, I want to make sure they're taken care of. It's just, you know, I always like, how does it fit in so how do we afford it? And Say that again. How does it fit all fit in so we can afford it? You and know, so people can also run their businesses and well, employ yeah, people. because at a certain point, I can only charge my consumer so much. You know, I can't pass my cost that far through. You can pass them a little bit. What happens if you go, what happens? This is really, people want to say this is a health care issue. It's also an issue of jobs and the economy. What happens, Frank, if you actually were to push harder and push it down to the cost of the product? It'd be, it'd be tough. I mean, in my business, where we're uh, in certain parts of my business, in the salon business where we're service provider driven, which means I do clients every day, they yeah. come to me. What <laughs> happens is those service providers say, like, hey, look, I'm going to go somewhere else yeah, because yeah. they're, you know, Raziri's doing something. See, because my whole industry is not on the same playing field. They're not all doing what you're doing. Not all. Some right, are. Right. You know, so if everyone's not on the same playing field, you know, things just change drastically. Isn't it interesting? People think it's just health care. Mm -hmm. But everything we're talking about affects your industry, affects your employees, affects the competition, affects the economy. Mm -hmm. We'll go to a break in a second, but help us on this, Rich. Well, I mean, <clears throat> it affects my industry. I'm in health care, but I'm a business, and I'm providing health insurance to employees, too. So the, think about that. Think of, the, think of the dynamic of being in a health care business and providing health insurance for our employees, too. So, so the key is going to be, and, and as we discuss this, you know, how do you provide a lower cost plan to the community and, and a lower premium product to the community? We're looking at this right now in our community. We're, we're talking to people like Frank and the small business community right. about, you know, Virtua is going to offer a lower cost product. We have to, to make sure people were affordable. Well, you're setting us up for uh, the next segment. We'll right. come right, right back after this break. We'll talk about that. And also, is it called tripling? We're talking about tripling, which is an initiative that, uh, that you're talking about in terms of finding ways to reduce costs and mm -hmm. uh, outreach and prevention and a whole range of other issues. As we talk about the healthcare landscape and the beautiful Garden State right after this. <laughs> to see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. By the way, I said tripling before. It's not tripling. It's, what's it again, Betsy? It's the triple aim. A triple aim. So that's, of course, I got the name wrong, but I know what it is. It's the right? Right care at the lowest cost in the right setting. Okay. So, and why is it so important? Uh, it is the goal, I think, of just about every healthcare provider in the nation uh, because it's the right thing to do for the community to lower costs but maintain quality. And, Rich, is everyone on board with this or only certain organizations? I think mostly everybody. If you're not on board with the triple aim process at this point, Steve, you're going to have some issues 
everybody's on board with it. And I think most providers, and I know Betsy and I talk about the people in New Jersey, we're there. Triple aim. Right. So you have to be targeted, very strategic in very this Very strategic. Let's talk about this. Outreach and prevention. What does it really mean, outreach and prevention? I, I think, Steve, in that regard, we're really talking, how do we reach consumers? Because they have skin in this game, too. We have to support them and having them understand that if, if they have type 2 diabetes or they have, you know, they have uh, hypertension, that that's going to affect them. Other comorbidities are going to occur in their life. We have to be able to work with them to reduce those chronic disease states. Is that also, it's interesting, is it also when we talk about outreach and prevention, let's well, say the outreach piece, education and outreach, let's mm -hmm. if I can put it that way, is it also educating people about end of life? Absolutely, yes. Especially well, since we don't want to talk about it? People don't want to talk about it, but we plan for everything else. And, <laughs> uh, and, and again, if, if at some point it's in, inevitable, this is something, a gift that you can give to your family, not only yourself, but What's your family. What's the gift? The gift is for them to know what your wishes are, what you want, so that if you get into a situation that you can't speak for yourself, that your family is not burdened by guessing um, and then feeling guilty afterward if they've done the right thing. So it's really honoring someone's wishes. So I'm curious about this. So for argument's sake, Frank, yeah. don't, don't, don't mind me doing this. So yeah. Frank's got this incredible laboratory of these wonderful people who work with him. He's out ahead of it and trying to do the right thing for his people. Say Frank were to, in all seriousness, say, listen, I want to get you all together and have a really candid conversation um, to help educate you and I brought some people in to talk about end of life issues and because we all face this, our families, our parents, our loved ones. Could you even imagine doing that? That's tough. That's tough. No, that's, that's what I'm that's saying. That's a, that's now, would, that be seen, would that be seen in all seriousness? This is a captive audience, an audience that you're committed to, they're your employees, you're providing certain health coverage, in some cases the law didn't even require you to do it. Here's my point. That's, a, that's an uncomfortable conversation, but a necessary one. We can't force people to do that, but... Well, well Steve, I think timing is everything. And is it not the right time? Uh, I, I think the right time is perhaps when you're diagnosed with a chronic disease. And recently, probably two years ago, uh, the governor signed, the legislature passed something called P the POLST document to allow practitioners to sit down with people diagnosed with chronic diseases to make a medical order that they oh, both co-sign and they, they plan for the end of life and what they want, if they want the most aggressive treatment possible, or do they want to live to their granddaughter's graduation or marriage. So timing matters. Timing matters. So you're not matters. talking to 25 year olds who are healthy and, and living the way they, they're gonna live forever, of course. You don't want, that's not the right time to talk about. I don't believe so. I mean, we're having difficulty getting those folks to sign up for health insurance, <laughs> period. So I and think we need them to keep the cost down, right? We absolutely do. So we it's when people are beginning to face certain issues. A chronic disease, yes. Okay. But I also think, Steve, as we go into the business community, and I talk to Frank about education of his employees, and how do we, you know, we can talk to them about chronic disease, but I would also say, you know, everybody has grandparents, everybody's had people in, in stages of life, and there may be an interest in understanding more about end-of-life care. I, I, frankly, I would ask Frank. Frank would probably ask his employees, what do you think? Do you guys want to know more? Right, Frank? I mean, you that's what I would about do. It? I mean, that's well, what, what I like to do. do. Explain, explain. I mean, we gather, I usually do it in small teams just to get kind of a pulse and, you know, deliver something to say, well, what do you think about end-of-life? Would you, would, would you like to talk about it? Would you like to learn more about it? And then I would bring the people from Virtua in to talk to my staff. I mean, uh, you know, at the end of the day, they have to be happy, and I want to just give them all the possibility to do it and still run a, a good business. Give them the information. You yeah. know, our best way to reach people is to go out into the business community, yeah. Steve, and talk to them, and because we, that's where yeah. the employees are. Yeah. And we have that now. We have, yeah. we had, Virtua had a, we have a, you know, a, every two months we do at each one of the locations where we bring everybody in, and some people at Virtua were talking about health and wellness, and, you know, the staff really likes it, and, you know, it, it it yeah. kind of stirs a conversation that they would normally not have. Yeah, but you got to set. You have to have an infrastructure to set that up. You right. have to have a team to set that up. It has to be consistent. It can't be episodic. Well, well, yeah, you know, my producers are keep raising this issue, which is a good one in preparation for the show. The issue of patient flow kept coming up. What does that? What does that really mean? Well, I think that's how the patient flows through the uh, hospital. Or doesn't. Or doesn't. Well, explain that. You're shaking your head. Well, yeah, well, part of it is, and Marianne and I were talking about this on the way up here today, Steve. I mean. Healthcare is so fragmented. Typically, in today's world, 
people don't use health care until they really need it. So they don't know where, where to start, frankly. So part of it is, where do they enter the health care system? How do they get access? How do they find their doctor? You know, how do they get treatment? How do they get lab tests, radiology? All that is fragmentation, that the that's the flow. That's the flow of patient care once they enter the system. And frankly, we don't do a good job of that. We need to do a better job of that in health care. We, we did a project a couple of years mm -hmm. ago with, yes, with a number of our members with the Institute for Healthcare Optimization mm -hmm. to focus on patient flow, to apply engineering principles to better move the patients. Engineering? Yes. Yeah. And what do you come up with? Uh, we, we came up with some successful solutions for moving patients more efficiently through the hospital system. For example, if you come into the emergency room and you unfortunately require surgery, most hospitals will have all the uh, surgical suites booked. We found if you, put, if you put one aside for the emergency room, it helps to ease the burden on the surgical suites. So principles like that have eased the uh, patient flow issue. You know what's so interesting as I'm listening to this, you begin to realize, I've often asked this question I'll, sometimes I'll say about the New Jersey economy or healthcare in New Jersey. People will say, they'll say, which New Jersey? Meaning, New Jersey is a very diverse state. You happen to physically be located in the southern part of the mm -hmm. state. You serve lots of different parts of the state. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, geographically we're diverse, ethnically we're diverse, racially we're diverse, age-wise we're diverse, and economically we're diverse, whole range of other areas. So here's why I'm getting to. Mm -hmm. and the issues that you're particularly concerned about, hospice, palliative care issues, mm -hmm. do you think that be, when it comes to, say, ethnic, racial, cultural, religious diversity, that our attitudes when it comes to end-of-life issues are somewhat colored by that diversity? Absolutely, yes. In fact, uh, we have a major, I'll say initiative, but it's just really woven into our fabric actually for diversity and inclusion to really reach out to those communities, bring them in and help them uh, understand, we want to understand what's important to them and how they view end of life and how can then we help them because we're there to help, help relieve suffering. That, that's our role and optimize that quality of life and everybody's going to experience mm -hmm. that and within their cultural, spiritual, you know, but part, diverse framework. But, sorry, but part mm -hmm. of the healthcare landscape in the state is a product of how diverse we are mm -hmm. and the language issues in the state. How could we talk about the healthcare landscape without dealing with the health, the, the, the language issues. How do we deal with that? You can't, you really can't because the state's becoming more diverse, communities are more diverse. So you have to have the capability of not only the language barrier, which is a major issue, yeah. but also the cultural barriers that you face through ethnicity. So you have to be prepared, and as Marianne said, you gotta be able to get into the communities and find out what their needs are and how to deal with the healthcare issues of various eth ethnic communities because they're growing. But don't you have to actually be, have to be set up to do that? I mean, like in, in, in your salon, in your schools, in your operation, you have people, kinds of diverse people come in? Yeah, absolutely. But, but, but you, don't, you don't sit there and go, okay, how do we have people who can communicate with all these people, or do you? Uh, like, somehow I mean, from you a technical, communicate. Well, from a technical aspect, you have to be able to do the work. So yeah. that's one part of it. Right. From the communication, I mean, I think hair's pretty, a little easier to communicate hair. Healthcare's more complicated. I would think so, yes. <laughs> but, but here's what I'm trying to get at. You, in healthcare, let's accept that it is more complicated. Right. You have to be set up to do that. Right. You have to be committed to doing right. that. You can't just say, oh, we have a desire to communicate and connect with you about healthcare. You have to be set up and spend money and do all those things. Well, part of it too, Steve, is you know, as the community gets more diverse, so does our workforce. So we're That's able to hire people from, a, 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 from a, uh, an ethnic diversity in our yeah. workforce now that supports our operation. So if I have a patient yeah. that can't speak, you know, speak English and speaks a yeah. different language, we have people inside the organization we bring forward that can communicate with them appropriately yeah. and, and can translate for us. Okay, a minute or so uh, left, minute and a half. Future of healthcare, what do you see? I really don't know. I mean, honestly, I mean, I, 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 I don't have a crystal ball, obviously, and I, I don't know because there's so many different moving parts. Just sitting here and hearing all this the things. This made better or worse for you? Uh, well, I think the more educated it. I am, the better I understand it. Um, doesn't make me still make me feel warm and fuzzy on the cost. <laughs> you know, I mean, at least at least I have a I have an idea on 
what all goes into it. Maybe and I can be better educated on asking the right questions, dealing with the right people to say, hey, how can I get my cost in line? And I, I believe with virtual, I'm doing that. So. A few seconds left. Future. I think it's very bright. I think providers in the state are focused like a laser beam on quality of care. I do think we need to do more to rein in health care costs, but we need to begin talking about pharmaceutical costs and insurance right. costs as well. Future. I think it's bright. You uh, do? I, uh, yes, I do. I think we're in a transition, and that's always uneven footing, but I think coordinated care and being person-centered and really pulling in other disciplines to address the whole person, that's really going to Give get Give me a few seconds, quality. 10 seconds. The delivery model's headed in the right direction, Steve. We're going outpatient. We're going to be a lower-cost model in the future. I'm excited about it. Okay. We'll keep this conversation going. Thank you very much. Very Thanks. educational. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence and 13 for WNET. NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, the New Jersey State Nurses Association, and the Institute for Nurses, the New Jersey Association of Health Underwriters, ShopRite Supermarkets, the North Ward Center, Josh S. Weston, and by Century 21 Construction. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios.